I am so grateful that you have decided to join me today. It is Tuesday, which means it's Bible study once again. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful again for your many blessings, for this day, this opportunity to read your Holy Scriptures, to open up your Word. We pray especially that you open up to us this book of Exodus as we learn a little bit more about what you are trying to tell us and all of humanity. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you have really chosen a great day to join me. We are looking at Exodus chapter 20, otherwise known as the Decalogue. And you're saying, I've never heard that phrase. Deca means 10. Decathlon, 10. Hmm. 10 commandments. That's probably how you know of the word, the Decalogue. Uh, but actually, the word Decalogue means 10 sayings. And I think that's a little more accurate about what's going on here in the book of Exodus chapter 20. But before we get there, I'm going to actually start with verse 18. Verse 18 is kind of an important verse for us to understand what's going on here in the Decalogue. It's the meeting with God. So let me read to you, verse 18 and what it says. I know it kind of, it's, it's really later in the chapter, but it gives us a sense of what God is trying to do. All the people perceived the thunder, the lightning, the flashes, and the sound of the trumpet, and the smoking mountains, and when the people saw it, they trembled, they stood at a distance. So this is how the people, the Jews, heard what we now call the Ten Commandments, the thundering of God in the mountains coming to them and speaking to them. That's how they perceived it. Thunder is often seen as a revelation of God, a theophany. Okay? Anytime you see this word theo, theology, it was related to God. And so here we are, a revelation of God was often seen in the mountaintops, in the thunder, and these types of natural events that maybe people might dismiss. But this was not common only to the Jews, or this was not uh, unique only to the Jews. This was common amongst all the peoples in the surrounding cultures. Uh, the Canaanites, you remember them? Oh, they were the enemy of the Bible. By the way, we've talked about this before. Jews are Canaanites. They're a branch of Canaanites. Um, nevertheless, the Canaanites worshipped a god called Baal, one of their gods. Of course, they had a, a, a veritable cornucopia of gods that they worshipped. Baal was one of the gods. He was a young buck. He was the guy that kind of took over leadership for his daddy. And uh, El, hmm, El. We hear that in the Bible, the word El is God. It's the same, it's a generic name for God. But his daddy, El, uh, of course, uh, this one, Baal, decided he was going to rule in his dad's stead. So Baal, he was often called, are you ready? The God of thunder, the God of the mountains, El Shaddai. Ooh, if you know anything about the Bible you know that the God of the Jews was also called the God of Thunder, the God of the mountains, El Shaddai. The Canaanite God, Baal, pre-existed the understanding of the Jews under uh, God, or their understanding of God. They came and they worshiped God, for he was this God, Baal, was the God of the mountains. Targidzi and Tarmagi, okay? Uh, Tarmagi, I apologize. So these are the same types of terminology used by the Jews. Remember, the Jews are Canaanites, so it kind of makes some sense. But, you know, there's this, this kind of religion of God being the God of thunder, God being the God of the mountains, is something that also existed in Greek ways of thinking. Now, the Greeks came after the Canaanites, and the Mesopotamians, the Can Mesopotamians and the Canaanites. And so who was the God of thunder, the God of the mountains? God of Mount Olympus and Greek way of freaking. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember anybody? Starts with a Z and ends with a Oos. Zeus, that's right. You got it. You guys are smart. He's the one who defeated the Titans and became the God of Mount Olympus. It was known by his thunder. So the Canaanites, the Greeks actually kind of got this from the Canaanites. 
Well, you know, the Jews often talked about God in the same way. God revealing himself through thunder, the God of the mountains. However, you also remember earlier in the book of Exodus when uh, Moses was asked, who do you say calls me? Just the God, or sent me to, to Pharaoh to help release the Jews from, uh, from imprisonment, slavery in Egypt to freedom. God gave them a, God gave, gave Moses a different name. Yes, God is God of the mountains. That was the understanding of the Canaanites and the Greeks. Yes, God is a God of thunder. Same understanding of the Greeks and the Canaanites. However, God is something else that they don't understand. We do not pronounce this word. I used to because I thought it was kind of cool. But you know, the Jews don't pronounce this word. They never pronounce this word. Whenever they see this word, they say Adonai, which means Lord. Okay? But this word means I am. So who is God? I am. God is the one who created us. God is the great I am, the one who pre-existed everything that exists. God is the one who resides amongst us. You're going to see that in just a moment when we talk about Sabbath, because that connects it to Genesis chapter 1. It is really important. This is the God of the Jews now. Okay, so yes, God is seen in the thunder and in the lightning. God is seen in the mountaintops. These are just natural revelations of God. I think in maybe in one sense, God was trying to talk to the Canaanites. God was trying to talk to the Greeks. But they didn't understand this aspect of God. The great I am. The one who wants to live amongst us. See, these gods kept their distance. But the great I am dwells amongst us. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, <laughs> okay. So this is the background. This is what's going on. This is how God is being revealed amongst us. Now, God is here making a covenant. And that's what Exodus chapter 20 is all about. A treaty with the Jews. I'm going to have a relationship with you. Baal doesn't have a relationship with his people. Zeus doesn't have a relationship with his people. But the, the great I am wants to have a relationship with us and is therefore going to make a treaty with us. That's what this is all about. So this was common. In fact, the Hittites, okay, they were ancient peoples. They had treaties that are very similar to the treaties that we have in the book of Exodus. Now, let me state this another way. The Hittites pre-existed the Jews. Okay, so this form of treaty that we see in the book of Exodus was very common in that day. It was, it was where Suzerain, a ruler, made a treaty with the vassals. This is my pledge to you. This is what I expect of you. And so it had a very common structure. Okay, so if you were to look, we actually have a lot of treaties that the Hittites would write with other vassal nations and states. It is exactly the same structure and form of Exodus chapter 20. We have this thing called the preamble. So this is where we're going to read the scripture. The preamble uh, in Genesis chapter uh, 20 is this. Are you ready? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. So I am the Lord of God is the preamble. It's a statement of who the Tzutzerain is. I am the Lord your God. So God is making a statement. But that's not all. So we have the preamble and then we have a historical prologue. So I'm just going to historical prologue, okay? So we have this historical prologue. That's the second part of verse uh, 2. I, the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, reminding them of what he's done for them. God is good and gracious to us. Therefore, we repent. God is good and gracious to us. Therefore, we want to be generous with what God has given us. Okay? 
God is good and generous to us. Therefore, we love others around us. You don't love people to get to heaven. You don't give of what you've been given in order to get to heaven. You don't repent because you want to get to heaven. That's already been done for you. By God, I'm the one that brought you out of slavery. Therefore, my hope is that you'll do this. And that's exactly what this is. Okay? Historical prologue. Then there are the stipulations of the treaty. Now, I've already kind of indicated to you, stipulations are what we call the Ten Commandments. That word commandment is really an inaccurate translation. They're ten sayings. They're ten wishes. This is my wish for you. And yes, that's kind of how this is being stated here. I, because I've done this for you, because I brought you out of here, I'm hoping that you're going to do this. Now these are, the Ten Commandments are the most egregious of things that they've done to one another, that humans could do to each other. It's not the limitation of everything that God expects of us. <laughs> and then, after the stipulations, we have a fourth thing that takes place, the deposition. It's the reception of the text. And that takes place in, Act. we don't get to read that in our lesson for today in Exodus 20, but that takes place in Exodus, I'm going to put that down, chapter 25, 16. If you want to go and look that up, that would be fantastic, because it means you are an advanced learner, all right? 25, 16, the deposition of the text. And then we've got number five, the public reading of the text. Now, again, we don't get to see that aspect of, of this treaty structure, but at least in the lesson we're reading today, but that actually takes point, place in chapter 24. Uh, I got the verse written down here, verses 4 and 7. And this is something that takes place in many times. It's that public reading of it. This, again, was very common. You Maybe you've heard of this book called the, uh, let me put it in a different text, just so you know, uh, different color. The uh, new, uh, the Enuma Elish. My E's are so bad. There you go. The Enuma, that's an E. <laughs> the Enuma Elish. It is, of course, a Mesopotamian, an ancient Mesopotamian story. It's not just a myth. It's a treaty very similar to this that was made by their god, Marduk, with the Mesopotamian peoples. Every year, the Enuma Elish was read publicly, recited publicly in a big festival. And there was a big drama that was done to say, this is what Marduk does for us, and how Marduk has come to love us and care for us, and establishes the authority, in this case, of the king. It was really a political document. The Enuma Elish is not so much mythology. It is but it's really about the establishment of the Mesopotamian king and his authority that it comes ultimately from Marduk. And that's what the Enuma Elish is all about. So um, Genesis 1, by the way, is a rebuttal of the Enuma Elish. There are atheists who will say, eh, Genesis 1 is just a rehashing of something that was done before. They are so stupid. They've never read Genesis 1 of the Enuma Elish. Genesis 1 is not just simply a rehashing of it. It does borrow some of the language, but it pushes back against the Enuma Elish. It says, this is what you understand of God. But no, 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 no. This is the way God truly is. So it's really a pushing back against the Enuma Elish. It's, 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 it's a furthering of the concepts. It, it's, it is a theological tussle with the Enuma Elish. That's what you're reading when you're reading Genesis 1. That's not all you're reading, but that's one of the things going on in Genesis chapter 1. Spectacular. Okay, let's go on. Let's go on. <laughs> let's go on. I know what's going on. We're getting into just some awesome stuff. That's what we're doing. Okay, so we've got these 10 sayings. Um... If you, if you have, we're Lutherans, 
if you know have a friend who's a Presbyterian, or if you've got a Jewish friend, and you look at how they order the Ten Commandments, and you look and say, wait a minute, you're not ordering the Ten Commandments the same. You're not ordering them correctly. Um, you know, the problem is, if you actually go through and read the Ten Commandments, it looks like there's 12 of them. Okay? Go ahead. I dare you to read it. And put, put aside the way you have traditionally and historically learned the Ten Commandments. You're saying, wait a minute, how do we get Ten Commandments out of that? And the problem is, is that, well, it's not a problem. It's just the truth. The Jews kind of recited these things in multiple occasions in multiple different ways. And so the recitations took on different forms. And and uh, the author of Exodus wanted to make sure all of these were included in here, okay? So all of the different recitations and all the different forms and all the different ways in which these were repeated were included in the book of Exodus. So don't, don't, don't get your tidy whities all in a butt about this. And don't worry about it. You know what? Uh, if you're a Presbyterian, you have an ordering of the Ten Commandments. It's not right! Uh, no, it's actually not incorrect. It's just probably a way in which we think about it. You know, I, I actually like the way the Jews do it. It's different than ours. I think it probably has that historic connection to the way Jews have thought about it. And, you know, they kind of disagree with both Presbyterians and Lutherans. So, it's all cool. It's not a big deal. Don't get so dogmatic about it. So, I'm not going to focus my attention on each of these ten sayings, but I will tell you it's broken down into two parts. One, sayings. Well, since I'm such a bad writer, I'm just going to do this. Sayings about God. And then guess what? Sayings about others. How we treat and how we care for one another. And it begins with a very interesting phrase. Um, you shall have no other gods before me. I'm just going to deal with this one. <laughs> Doesn't that seem to imply that there were other gods? Hmm. Explain that one to me. Riddle me that. Here's the thing about the Jews. Remember, they are just now being introduced to this god. They don't know who this God is. And I will tell you that the Jews, prior to this introduction to this God, didn't really know who this God was. Yes, they knew Abraham, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. But they did think that there were other gods running around out there. They were not yet a monotheistic people. We seem to think that the Bible comes to us fully formed and the people came to us fully formed in their faith. They didn't. They're growing in their relationship with God. They didn't understand that there was one God. They still had this understanding there were multiple gods. But our God is reign supreme. Uh, so, yes, this is included in here. <laughs> there certainly was an idea early on that there might have been other gods. But our God is reigning supreme. But eventually, it was in that progressing of that revelation of who God is. There is only one God. They grew in their understanding of God to come to a monotheistic point of view. They're one of only two groups of people who understood that God was one God. And there was only one God back in the times of the Old Testament. Okay, so let's go on with this. So, again, there are stipulations or sayings about our relationship with God, stipulations about how we order our relationships with one another. But guess what? There is one saying that stands right smack dab in the middle. Remember the Sabbath day. So, there's a real synergy about this. Both ways. The sayings about others, the sayings about God, all focus on the Sabbath day. We are supposed to think about Genesis chapter 1 when we see this commandment. And to realize that Genesis chapter 1 the focus of Genesis chapter 1 isn't creation of and the order of creation. That's important. 
But it ultimately, Genesis chapter 1, and the true focus of Genesis chapter 1 is that seventh day. That is finally creation coming to its fulfillment. That God dwells amongst us. That's what the Sabbath day is all about. This is something that no other God does. Remember we're talking about Baal, the God of thunder in the mountains of the Canaanite religion? That, that God didn't reside amongst the people. That God was distant. Remember, Zeus? Zeus never came down from Olympus to meet with God's people. You know, Zeus was kind of indifferent about people. This God. The God of the Jews is the God who Sabbaths amongst us, is living amongst us, tabernacles amongst us, dwells in our midst. That's why it's so spectacular when Jesus was born and God came to dwell amongst us in Jesus Christ, to tabernacle amongst us. This is something no other religion understood or believed. So this commandment is the center and the focus of the Ten Sayings. It's all about God and God's dwelling amongst us. Woo! <laughs> Isn't this spectacular? The problem with all of these sayings, and there is a problem, they all fall short. They're beginning points. They're beginning points for a relationship with God. But they are most certainly not our ending point. Jesus, you know, Jesus is always the right answer, right? Jesus is the fulfillment, okay? Why? Because if you remember, the 10 sayings are divided in two sections, about God and about our relationship with others. Hmm. We as Christians should think about the two sayings of Jesus. He reduces it to this. Love, what? God, neighbor. I know you're, whoa, I'm going kind of sideways there. You can look that way. Here, I'll turn it that way. How does that help? Love, God, with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbors ourselves. This is the fulfillment of all of this. This is just a beginning point. It cannot ever, law can never communicate a relationship with God because it's not flexible enough. It always falls short. It's not flexible enough for the circumstances. The way I love you is different than the way I love my wife because it's a contextual thing. I have a different relationship with my wife than I do you. So loving you might just mean my picking up the phone and calling you. To love my wife might mean I need to take this afternoon and spend some time with her and just make sure she's tended to. And make sure I do the dishes. Make sure I do some of the chores that she, she needs to see done. Or make sure I... Uh, you know, whatever, rub her shoulders. Make sure I tell her I love her on a regular basis. These are important things to my relationship with my wife, right? Not things I'm going to do for you. I'm not going to come and rub your feet at nighttime. It just isn't going to happen. All right, I'm not going to do that. It's contextual in nature. How we love depends upon whom we are loving and the type of relationship we have with them. This is the problem with the sayings of the Old Testament. They always fall short because they cannot communicate every circumstance and relationship. Oh, but this does. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Oh, this is... Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm on a roll. Give me another minute. You know, we call this the golden rule. Um, and of course, People will point out that, you know, that pre-existed Jesus. Of course it did. But the statements of the golden rule, to love your neighbor as yourself, um, were always in the negative. Don't do to others 
what you don't want done to you. Jesus makes everything positive. Do to others as you would have them do to you. So it's a much different way of thinking. So yes, it's true what Jesus says is based upon what came before. However, he transforms it. It's all about how we love, not how we avoid to do it. So it's easy to avoid killing somebody. That's very Old Testament. Don't kill somebody. I haven't killed anybody. Whoo, good for me. I'm such a good person. No, but Jesus turns it around and says, no, it's, it's how you love them that's important. So Jesus adds another dimension to this, and this is why law never fulfills the intention of God's command. I, I'm telling you what, we got two crazy people today, two crazy groups of people, right wing and left wing po politically in involved Christians. I'm sorry, but you all are crazy. You want to know why? Okay. Oh, you're mad at me now. I get it. Because the right wing is all about the law. We got to get the Ten Commandments up in those up in those courthouses because that's of God. And oh my goodness, can you believe this courthouse is removing the Ten Commandments? Oh my goodness, and you think that their heads are going to explode. It's all about the law. The left wing is all about justice. Justice. You see, this is all so Old Testament crap that Jesus rejects. And you know what? It's not even what the Old Testament wanted of us. The Old Testament realized we, we just couldn't fulfill God's expectation. We didn't understand this. We were growing in a relationship with God. So yes, there was law. Yes, there was this concept of justice. But this is also very Old Testament. Neither the law of the right wing or the justice of the left wing fulfills God's expectations. And you guys are out here crying and screaming and yelling, we need justice, we need it now. No, we don't need justice because we'd all be dead if we had true justice. Oh, left wing doesn't get that. My left wing Christians, my brothers and sisters, if we had justice, we'd all be dead. You would be too. If we all had, had to live by the law and by the Ten Commandments, you'd all be dead too. You know what the Old Testament says about what you should do with disobedient children? Oh, kill them! You don't live by the law. What do we live by? A new law called love. I could use a few more underlines. It wouldn't, would hurt. <laughs> it doesn't do it justice, honestly. We live by love, not by the law, not by justice. You want to know why? Because these are inflexible. They cannot deal with every circumstance in life. When you try to apply justice, it's always an injustice to somebody else. It always runs roughshod over somebody else. Whenever you try to apply the law, it doesn't take into consideration every circumstance. That every relationship is unique. And every circumstance is unique. God's love gets lived amongst this world through seven and a half billion people and every single one of us is unique. There's no law, there's no justice that could possibly apply equally to all seven and a half billion people. I'm telling my brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to give up this collusion with the politics of the world of law and justice because Jesus has something different. <sighs> love. Love. Jesus is the end or the fulfillment of God's expectations. The law was just kind of pointing us in that direction. Justice is kind of pointing us in that direction. But God has a better way for us to operate in a relationship with one another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a great lesson. 
I give you thanks for this. For it is a reminder to me. I, I, want, I want justice. I want stability. I want the law. We all do. We ought to feel like we're being treated fairly and rightly. But this is not the way of the kingdom of heaven. The way of the kingdom of heaven is love and mercy and kindness. We Christians have forgotten this today. So I'm begging you that you would help us. Help us to restore your love and your mercy. Not your law and not your justice. Justice will be done when we love. The law will be fulfilled when we love. But these concepts of law and justice are just too inflexible to do the great big thing you've called us to accomplish, which is to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbors ourselves. Give us the courage to be able to do this, and may your Holy Spirit inspire us and guide us. We're going to fail, but you dust us up, pick us up, dust us off, and send us back, back out again to try again. So give us courage and peace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love God and love your neighbor. Amen.